Science Foundation. We want to acknowledge National Science Foundation for providing funding to make these events possible. Uh, today we are launching a series of four events. Each panel will have a different focus within the theme of adjective manufacturing security. In each panel, we will have invited panelists from academia and industry uh, to present a broad perspective of security issues and possible solutions. And we hope that the information that emerges from these panels can guide some of the future research efforts in manufacturing security area and develop industry relevant security solutions. So my information is given here. Uh, you can send me an email or follow the Twitter feed. The registration for this panel link is also given and uh, some of these slides will be posted on Twitter and LinkedIn so you can follow the information there. The other relevant events that uh, CC, uh, CCS is organizing this year is a series of events which we have been organizing for many years now. A Cybersecurity Awareness Week which is from November 5th to 8th. It's a virtual event this year given the pandemic situation. Hack at Deck, it's a hardware security challenge. It's organized as part of the design automation conference. And uh, Hack 3D, which is additive manufacturing security challenge. Uh, we are going to release the primary challenge starting September 15th. And then the final round will be from November 3rd to 5th, 2020. So please follow these events and uh, the information is available on our websites, Twitter, LinkedIn, and all other places. Uh, the next panel is going to be on diversity in cyber physical system workforce and research. More information about this panel will be released in coming days, but August 24th is a date you can mark on your calendar. At this point, I'm going to hand over the panel to today's moderator, Dr. Hammond Pierce. He's from Center for Cybersecurity, New York University. He will introduce the panelist and then moderate the panel from this point onwards. Uh, thank you, Dr. Pierce, and you can take over now. Uh, thank you, Professor Gupta. Great. Um, so, yes, to the today's topic that our panelists are going to be talking about is on the challenges in IP protection. Uh, just to briefly introduce the problem space, additive manufacturing, which is also known as 3D printing, offers a number of attractive value propositions to industry, such as fast prototyping, the ability to customize production runs, uh, pull-based manufacturing strategies where you produce your products on demand, and the ability to design and produce more complex part shapes than traditional manufacturing techniques might allow. However, adopting these new approaches and additive manufacturing in general does not come without risks. And it's across the series of workshops that Professor Gupta introduced that we're gonna be discussing. Uh, so I'm going to briefly introduce each panelist before they do a, a very short talk before we get onto the panel discussion. Um, so to begin with, I'm going to start us off with Don Jones. Uh, Don has over 27 years of experience in numerous roles across global logistics and supply chain companies with Caterpillar Logistics Services. And after retiring now works as an executive in residence with Carlisle and Company specializing in aftermarket parts logistic strategies with a special focus on additive manufacturing. He's going to start us off by talking about the opportunities for 3D printing to change aftermarket part production. Uh, take us away, Don. Great. Thanks so much, Hammond. Let me, um, let me start my screen share. Can you see my screen? Uh, not yet. Can you try again? Sure, just a second. Great, thanks, Tom. Good now? Yes, you're good. Great, thanks. Well, thanks everybody for joining and certainly delighted to be here to, to cover uh, the impact of additive manufacturing on supply chain. Today I'm going to cover three areas briefly, talk about additive manufacturing specifically as it relates to aftermarket parts, uh, cover a number of areas of how I believe additive can affect total global supply chain performance, and then discuss some of the 
security and intellectual property concerns as a uh, transition into the other experts on the panel to talk about where that's headed. So if you look at added manufacturing, and I'm sure that most of the people on the line here have a lot of background in additive, the current state of the industry is that the applications are rapidly multiplying across the areas you see on the left, medical, aerospace, high tech, automotive, um, food, games, pop culture even, and then of course fashion. I'm sure people have seen uh, recent tennis shoes custom made by Adidas and so on. One of the interesting things that's occurring is the rapid decrease in cost. And it's not all about the cost of the printers or the materials being reduced, but it's also the speed. So the fact that the printers may not be much less expensive to purchase or lease for the machine itself, but they are sometimes two, three, five X faster than they were. So the overall production cost can, tends to go down. Metal printing technology is now viable. Polymers have been around for, for decades, basically. Metal printing is really becoming viable for production. There are huge applications in the industries that I'll cover here around aerospace and automotive and industrial. Some of the things that are changing there rapidly that are really important are around the sintering process for the metals to strengthen them and to make sure that they, that the that the parts can shrink isotropically and maintain their shape as they are centered. A lot of work being done there. Materials, many, many kinds of alloys now that are, that are available that weren't in the past. And then uh, increasing ability to do hardness with low porosity makes the changes in metal printing very attractive for parts. Metal advancements is exponential. I'm sure you've all seen the things happening around um, being able to print tissues, and structures for uh, replacing body parts. Um, interestingly, I, I believe uh, a year or two ago, all hearing aids are now made with additive manufacturing. So if you didn't convert to additive 3, uh, 3D printing technology, then you're not making hearing aids anymore. So a lot of things happening in medical. But with all of these, security and authenticity is a major concern. Uh, I'll cover that more in detail here in just a moment. And again today, and my focus is gonna be on auto industrial and uh, aerospace parts for prototyping and production. So if we look at where it's headed, uh, there'll be continued usage and increasing usage even in prototyping and jigs and fixtures. The ability to very in inexpensively print prototypes and plastics continues to be attractive to train engineers to do a lot of uh, shortcut on design work and, and produce the production parts much faster. The big impact that's gonna happen on aftermarket parts is on the ability to improve availability and reduce back orders, especially on out of production parts. This is a huge issue for automotive, industrial and aerospace companies. They typically have a slow moving part profile. The products that they make last many years or decades, so they go through a tremendous amount of rebuild but over their life cycle, they become slower and slower moving parts, but you still need to have the parts. You know, a good analogy is it may take 100 parts to rebuild the transmission. 98 of them are fast movers, but the last two that only are sold once a year still have to be there or you can't do the repair. So those parts need to still be serviced. And they typically have a long lead time uh, from the supply base. And this ability to support these parts is part of the brand promise of these companies. So relief on inventory and the ability to positively impact space uh, is, a, is a huge benefit for these companies that can move into additive, especially with metals. So they typically store uh, or service a million or more part numbers and the vast majority of those parts are slow moving. So there's a tremendous amount of warehouse space around the planet being used to store these slow moving parts. The ability to print on demand 3D print the part near the point of consumption is, a, is a, a game changer for many companies in distribution servicing and cost. Another opportunity with additive is to be able to reduce tooling. Uh, these low volume, no source parts, typically the supplier that made the part originally, the tooling is gone. And to get the part made traditionally, they have to recreate the tooling with additive, no tooling is necessary. So this is a, a, a great benefit of being able to additively manufacture parts. The um, 
supply chain costs on high MOQ, this follows into this last bullet. Typically, if you go to a supplier for these slow moving parts, you only need one or two of them to satisfy your demand for two years, but the supplier won't start that production unless you buy 100. So then you're at the supplier's whim of whatever they want to charge for the tooling, and then you have 25 or 30 years of supply for parts that you're now storing. So ability to print on demand eliminates that. It also uh, can eliminate a lot of expedited transportation, which is a significant cost element for these types of companies to fly parts all over the planet that are not stocked in the area where demand's occurring. That also drives a big win in sustainability. The ability to print on demand near the point of consumption will have tremendous benefits in reducing air freight, large lot storage, wasteful packaging. So there are a number of wins uh, beyond just, quote, just CO2 that could be gained with uh, the implementation of additive. The last thing is related to additive, but I wanted to just plant a seed here is on digitization of parts catalogs. Most companies don't have a lot of their catalog digitized today. So obviously you need a 3D rendering to be able to print a part. So it's critical for that, but it also has other benefits. The ability to have been search tools to improve engineer productivity, um, which is a, a big impact on part proliferation. So many of these companies, like I mentioned, have a million or two million part numbers. A lot of them are very similar. They're off by a millimeter. They're, the bore on the hole is just slightly from one part to the other. It's, it's off by millimeters. So if engineers could find existing parts with a digital search, they could uh, stop some part proliferation. The last thing around the digitization, which again enables the print, is to enable 3D content on e-commerce sites. So as companies become more uh, able to sell online, be able to actually have a customer find the part, rotate it in 3D space. Oh yeah, that's my part. That's the one that has the bracket on the back. I can order that. They can gain market share back. So investing in digitization of the catalog drives a tremendous amount of benefits for companies. But the real win on additive for these companies is around design for 3D. So as our engineers are more and more familiar with the technology, they can start to do uh, honeycombing or organic, uh, organic layering where they eliminate weight in a part but have the same strength. Tremendous opportunity to, reduce, to eliminate welds and loose and leak joints in, uh, in parts. New materials, new alloys, and the ability to incorporate uh, IP and counterfeit protection are all major wins for companies that can design for 3D. So my last chart is to really talk about IP protection. The chart on the top right was produced by Deloitte a few years ago, and this covers the actors and the impacts of cyber threat. And I know the, the uh, colleagues on the panel are gonna cover these in more detail, but there are a lot of opportunities here for threats in this space. And the reason that they're important is there uh, the four on the, on the top left there. These threats have to be mitigated. Print integrity, imagine if you will that, um, that a build file is created for a, a piece of an airplane wing, a, a strut if you will, and a bad actor gets a hold of that drawing and can modify the build of the part so that it fails at 2G where it was designed to last 6G. So there could be some significant impacts on aerospace if the print integrity and the design integrity are not, are not protected. Counterfeiting is a big opportunity for companies. They don't wanna have counterfeit parts out coming back as warranty claims when they fail. And they also want to make sure they don't have the brand damage that occurs when that happens. The, the theft of design and build file, the printers are becoming less and less costly. Like I mentioned, metal, metal printers are still quite expensive, but there are much lower boundaries or barriers to entry for companies now that want to, that want to manufacture parts. So the protection of the design file and the build file are both critical for these companies as they begin to ramp up 3D. And then the ability to create new and, new and uh, exotic alloys and formulate their own IP around material specs is another key, key piece of their IP that has to be protected. To do that, we need, we need some focus areas. The, there are a few of these here mentioned out of six, but the network is the main thing to make sure as the drawings are moved around the network, they're encrypted and protected. Perhaps the printer intercepts the drawing, deletes the file after it's printed or it's encrypted at the point of print. 
the databases that store all the files we spoke about, and then the actual printer setup itself. This is, an, this is actually IP, being able to, to decide how to print your part, what orientation in X, Y, and Z axis is needed to properly have the part have strength, also the temperature, the vibration control, the speed of the print, those are all IP elements that have to be protected as companies begin to ramp up this technology. So there's a lot of opportunity here, tremendous amount of work uh, by OEMs and by vendors, and of course by universities in these spaces, but addressing the security areas are really mandatory for additive to meet its full potential. So those are my comments, Anna. All right, thanks. Um, thanks, Don, that was great. Uh, so the next panelist we're going to be having today um, is Professor Nectarios Tuchos, who is an assistant professor with the Department of Electrical and Computer Engineering at the University of Delaware, with a joint appointment in the Department of Computer and Information Sciences. His research interests are in cybersecurity and applied cryptography, with a special focus in hardware security, secure 3D printing, and trustworthy computing. Uh, just a quick note for all the attendees, uh, Zoom has a question and answer facility built into it. And as we're going to be after these presentations doing Q&A, um, I encourage anyone, if you have any questions, to just submit them at any time. Uh, Professor Chuchos will now be introducing and discussing ad additive manufacturing side channels. Uh, thank you very much for the kind uh, introduction, uh, Hammond. Um, so uh, I just want to double check if everybody can see my screen. Uh, yes, we've got it. Okay, excellent. So uh, as uh, Hamon mentioned, uh, I'm Nectar Stutos. I'm uh, with the University of Delaware. And I'm also the director of the Trustworthy Computing Group, uh, as you can see here. Me and my students are working to solve uh, cybersecurity problems that affect security and privacy. Uh, in uh, outsourcing applications and also in 3D printing. And today I will be talking about how side channel threats can actually affect cyber physical systems and additive manufacturing. I also want to mention uh, that uh, my team is organizing cybersecurity competitions in the area of embedded and IoT system security. And this is part of the Cybersecurity Awareness Week, CISO, as uh, uh, Dr. Gupta and Hammond mentioned uh, earlier. Okay, so in order to introduce the problem, uh, I would like to talk a little bit about the additive manufacturing process chain. So the process chain typically comprises three big steps. The computed edit design phase, and let me see if I can annotate the screen, which is this area here. We also have the computed edit manufacturing phase here, and then we also have testing and assembly which is here. Now, the way the process chain works is at the beginning, we have some design teams that they create the CAD models and they can do that uh, by using specialized software. And they create several candidate designs. Uh, for example, this is shown here as design model one, design model two and uh, design model three. And all these uh, candidates, they go through an iterative process uh, with specialized tools that perform finite element analysis in order to be able to select uh, a candidate file for production. And after this uh, model is selected, then we have uh, an STL file. Um, STL file stands for stereolithography file that uh, essentially encodes all the information required into a set of uh, triangles, essentially points in the 3D space. And using this representation of the file, it is possible to slice uh, the 3D object into thin layers that corresponds to the tool path that the 3D printer, uh, the additive manufacturing machine, is going to uh, produce. So this uh, G code essentially corresponds to instructions for the motors of the printer to be able to produce the file, okay? And after the file is produced, you can use different techniques like uh, uh, fuse deposition modeling, stereolithography, or sintering to be able to get uh, your 3D object, okay? This is the computer-dated manufacturing step. And at the end, um, you 
I can select some uh, random samples to uh, perform non-destructive testing. So based on, on this model of the additive manufacturing process chain, we have to start thinking what are the assets that we want to protect from a cybersecurity perspective? What is the information or what is the intellectual property we uh, would like to protect from external threats? And here, uh, of course, as uh, most of us already uh, guessed, the 3D model uh, is part of the intellectual property. But also at the same time, we want to protect the stereolithography representation, which is the set of points in the 3D space that correspond to the original 3D model. And also we want to protect the instructions that go into the machine. Because if any of these three assets is revealed to uh, a third party or a party that is not trusted, uh, maybe they would be able to uh, access the original intellectual property. So the main, the main concern here, the main asset I would say, is the intellectual property that is encoded either as the 3D uh, CAD model or the STL or G code representations, okay? And uh, for each one of these slides uh, at the bottom, I'm putting uh, a link to the relevant uh, research paper that uh, discusses these notions. So now that we understand uh, what is the uh, supply, the process chain for additive manufacturing, we can now, uh, summarize what are the corresponding uh, threats. So we will, in the attacks, so we will uh, classify them in five categories. Uh, we will say when the attack is going to happen, uh, what is the abstraction uh, layer, what are the means of the attacker, what is the impact of the, of the attack, and what is the intent of the attacker, what is, uh, what's the goal of the attacker. So as we can see, uh, an attack can happen at the CAD stage when we have, uh, we generate the CAD file, the finite element analysis where we define the 3D model, the model, or during slicing where we take the STL file and we generate the G code, or during printing. And of course, if you want to produce, uh, if, if, the if the attack is to produce uh, artifacts that have uh, worse properties than the original, we can also launch an attack during testing and assembly, right? Uh, affect testing or in doing correct assembly. Now, of course, all these attacks can be applied at different abstraction levels. For example, we can have the attack at the firmware level of the printer, the material composition. There are papers that describe how you can um, introduce uh, issues, you, you can introduce contamination into the material that we use. Also, it can be in the file storage for the databases uh, that, that you store your original model. It can happen at the software level, the software that you use to generate the models or the software that is used uh, for slicing, for example. And finally, it can happen at the actuators and the sensors of the 3D printer. So, uh, and of course, uh, without going into too many details, uh, you can uh, you can use different methods. Uh, for example, you can use uh, you can add or remove material. You can use side channels. You can use uh, Trojan horses. You can do corruption. And at the end of the day, the outcome is that you will have poor performance. You can uh, you can lose it, you can leak information to outsiders. You can have early failure, contamination, as I said before. And the intent is, of course, most of the time is uh, for profit or because you, someone wants to uh, cause sabotage or, or uh, steal the IP. And sometimes it's also overproduction. You, uh, someone orders 100 uh, 3D printed objects and someone wants to put into circulation more than that, let's say 200. So in, uh, in my comments today, I would like to focus on side channel attacks. And this means that we are gonna focus on the printing step uh, that essentially involves the actuators and the sensors of the printer. And we're gonna talk about a side channel method to be able to uh, steal IP. Okay, and I'm gonna give some examples. Uh, actually, I'm planning to do uh, a quick survey uh, and give some examples uh, that are in the literature. So I would like to start with uh, more uh, 
general example of how side channels can actually leak and exfiltrate information. Here, we're going to focus on a side channel that is based on acoustic information. It is based on sound. Uh, and the goal of this attack, and here at, at the bottom I'm uh, citing the paper that discusses this attack, is to steal cryptographic information, steal cryptographic keys. So in this attack, as you can see, we have uh, uh, this is an auditorium, and there is a laptop here, and there is another computer that uses a, a parabolic microphone. So this is the laptop, and this is the microphone. Now, as it turns out, when electronic circuits are performing intensive operation, like cryptographic operations, they produce a high-pitched noise. This is mostly inaudible, but if you use a very powerful uh, microphone, you can get access to this information and you can analyze it. And this is what uh, the research discussed in this reference does. They are able to attack the very popular RSA algorithm. RSA, the RSA algorithm is used widely uh, on the internet for, uh, for public key cryptography. And this is how most electronic transactions that we do in e-banking and e-commerce uh, are based upon. So this is just an example of what can be the impact of a side channel where you can just eavesdrop and listen to, infor to the sound, the, the high-pitched noise that the computer is uh, producing from a distance, uh, this is uh, a few feet away, uh, to be able to understand what is happening inside the computer. This is a, a, another recent uh, work. This is from uh, 2020, where you can actually use uh, a, uh, a telescope and some sensors to be able to eavesdrop what is being said in a remote location by uh, trying to understand the, vi the acoustic vibrations caused to the lights in the room. So uh, here's a room. There are some victims uh, unsuspecting of, of uh, what's happening. They are having a conversation. And their voice actually causes vibration to the lamp in the room. And the eavesdropper, the attacker, is using this side channel information, which is essentially uh, the vibration of the surface of the bulb, using a telescope and a very, very sensitive sensor to be able to analyze this signal and actually identify or, or and classify what is being said. So uh, the paper uh, actually shows that it is possible to uh, identify a song. So this is the uh, song, Let It Be. And this is uh, the analysis. So you have, this is the signal that the optical sensor can detect. You have uh, the detected uh, uh, sound that is being produced in the room. And this is the original signal. So as we see, these are two examples. One example is how we can steal information using side channels from a laptop that is uh, decrypting some information using RSA, which can be devastating because you will lose your secret keys. And here we can eavesdrop conversation from a distance. And there are two research papers that discuss that. So having said that, the question is, uh, can we do something similar? Can we leak intellectual property in additive manufacturing using side channels? And of course, the answer is yes. And, and this is, uh, uh, why uh, I would like to introduce this threat uh, to this audience and demonstrate, uh, first of all, a case of an acoustic side channel that is based on the noise that the printer motors are producing. So here the idea is that you have a target 3D printer and using a, a microphone, you are able to uh, acquire the, the acoustic data, the, the, the sound, the noise that is produced by the different motors, the step motors on a 3D printer, okay? So this is a side channel attack. And the attacker, after acquiring this information, uh, can develop uh, a machine learning model to be able to estimate what are the movements in the X, Y, and Z coordinate uh, that the motors in the printer uh, are doing, okay? So, so the attacker, 
the goal of the attacker is to be able to identify from some distance using the audio side channel uh, what is the movement uh, of the head of the 3D printer. And after this is done, then the attacker will be able to identify the toolpath, which is essentially the Z code that was given to the printer to be able to print the 3D object. And after this is done, the attacker can perform IP theft. Okay, and here I'm gonna give you a quick example. So on the left side, we see uh, an original example, an original uh, 3D object. Uh, this is the object that we are actually printing. This is the reconstruction of the object. This is essentially a model of a key without doing any post-processing. Okay, and as you can see, there are some errors in the reconstruction because the, the machine learning model and the re reconstructed Z code is not perfect. So essentially what is happening here is the printer is trying to print this key here. And uh, by performing this side channel uh, attack, we reconstruct the Z code and we try to print it again to see what is going to be uh, the new 3D object and compare those two. So the idea is that if you don't do any post-processing, there are going to be some errors. However, it is possible to do post-processing and then the original and the reconstructed, they look fairly similar. So this is a successful acoustic side channel attack uh, using a 3D printer, which means that if, if uh, a company has a 3D printer on premises, uh, and there is, some, for example, a malicious insider that they would try to exfiltrate information. This is possible by just recording uh, the, the audio signals coming from the printer, the sound that comes from the printer. Now, this is a more sophisticated and more advanced attack that combines acoustic information and magnetic information. And this is launched by just using a smartphone. This is a Nexus 5 smartphone that incorporates a microphone for acoustic information to be able to collect acoustic side channel data. But also it has a magnetometer, which means uh, it is able to uh, collect magnetic side channel information. Okay, this is not to be confused with a compass. It has a specific mag magnetometer sensor. So in this, uh, and, and I have the paper uh, here that gives more details about this attack. So here, uh, by placing the mobile device 20 centimeters um, close to the 3D printer and, and by uh, writing a specific program that runs on the mobile phone, it is possible to collect side channel information, analyze it and try to reconstruct the original object. So, so let me uh, explain uh, especially how the magnetic side channel works here. Uh, the 3D printer has step motors, and the way the step motors are energized, energized they have uh, several electromagnets, and in order to cause rotation, uh, different electromagnet is activated at different time, and this means that as the printer head moves up and down, you can see the magnetic field changing in the sensor. So you can detect, essentially, if uh, the, the Y axis, uh, moves up or if it moves down, okay? So you can collect this information and combine it along with acoustic information. So you combine these two into a machine learning model and then you can have a reconstruction, that a virtual reconstruction of the object. So here in red, you can see the original shape um, and with uh, the, the uh, black lines here you can see what is the reconstruction and again this reconstruction does not include the post-processing uh, step where you smooth uh, its path and this is the smooth one okay and this is uh, and and uh, here this is what it looks like if you try to print the reconstructed so these are just two examples where we can use acoustic or magnetic information to be able to exfiltrate the IP directly from the 3D printer. Now the question is, are there any other potential side channels? And the answer is yes. Uh, one other potential side channel is a power side channel where you just monitor the power consumption of the printer. And of course, here, uh, the goal is to be able to correlate the, the signal that you get uh, the power trace that you get and you analyze 
to the actual step motor movements. And of course, this is a little bit complicated because you need to filter the movement uh, in its axis and you need to train a model to be able to identify that. Also, another potential uh, side channel is a vibration side channel. And here the idea is that you need to use accelerometers to be able to detect the vibration signal. Maybe you can use uh, a smartphone. And the goal is, again, to identify the movement of the different motors in the 3D printer and, and be able to generate and reconstruct uh, the G code and then the original object. This is how you would uh, steal the IP. Of course, there are, there are big challenges here. Uh, and this is an active area of research. So there are uh, some researchers keep looking for new potential side channels that can affect additive manufacturing. Now, uh, what are the potential mitigations? Uh, all is not lost, of course. There are some uh, 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 ideas that uh, people are applying. One is to introduce acoustic interference. Essentially, it should introduce uh, noise in the same uh, room, in the same area where the 3D printer is, in order to thwart potential attacks. Uh, that are happening. Of course, this can have uh, health concerns, right? If, if there is an operator working in a noisy environment, uh, that can have potential health concerns for the operator. Also, there are uh, ideas of trying to apply active noise cancellation. Uh, this is uh, the same thing as uh, wearing headphones for noise cancellation in an airplane, but now you are trying to introduce this noise cancellation in an open space. And of course, there are concerns of how effective this could be, given that the, the, the acoustic side channel that comes from the printer is not uh, uh, a steady noisy signal. There, there are many uh, changes happening uh, very quickly. So it would be very challenging to apply active noise cancellation. Regarding uh, electromagnetic and sound, and sound audio side channels, uh, there are proposed solutions to seal the printers, but that potentially would increase the cost. Or, or to be able to introduce in the G code redundant movements to confuse the attacker. So instead of only printing the 3D object, you can also ask the 3D printer to do some redundant innocuous movements uh, without extruding any material in order to confuse any potential attacker. But of course, uh, that would increase your, your uh, energy bill because you, you would use more power and it would make the print process slower. And for vibration, there are some proposals uh, to use uh, anti-vibration paths. So these are the quick comments I would like to make to introduce the problem of side channels in additive manufacturing. And uh, I welcome uh, any questions during the Q&A uh, and the discussion with the panelists. Thank you, Hamid. All right, thanks, Nectarius. Uh, our final panelist uh, is Professor Ramesh Kari um, from the Department of Electrical Computer Engineering at New York University. He co-directs the NYU Center for Cybersecurity and also co-founded the Trust Hub, as well as organizing the annual Embedded Systems Challenge. Uh, he's going to quickly walk us through an additive manufacturing attack taxonomy before we move on to our overall panel discussion. Uh, Ramesh, are you there? Yes, uh, thank you all for joining us. Uh, Hammond, thanks for the introduction. Uh, thank, uh, Hammond will control my slides. Uh, Hammond, could you move to the next slide, please? Uh, if you look at this slide, it roughly gives my background of research. Uh, over the years, electronic hardware has become the core root of trust for most systems, your buildings, your pets, and everything in between. Uh, but more recently, about a couple of decades ago, uh, the electronic supply chain has become more globalized, uh, uh, introducing numerous security issues in the sense that design is done in one place and fabrication is done elsewhere, and so on and so forth. And because of this globalization and the associated security implications, the electronic hardware route of trust is no longer trustworthy. Uh, the systems that use these circuits are no longer trustworthy as well. So what my research and my team's research has done at NYU is we pioneered the area of hardware cybersecurity to investigate 
the implications on how integrated circuits and systems will be and should be designed and more importantly, verified and validated. So I want you to go to the next slide, Hammond. So what I want to focus on and what I will focus on are the mechanical artifacts. Uh, could we move back to the previous slide? Uh, the, the, the mechanical artifacts that the electronics is embedded in are drives or steers. For example, if you focus on the aircraft mechanical structures, wings, nuts and bolts. For example, if you focus, if you consider the physical antenna, it's the physical artifact and not the electronics used to steer it. This is where additive manufacturing or digital manufacturing is being increasingly used as one of my uh, panelists has alluded to early on. So what I will do is talk about hardware side. When I say hardware cybersecurity, I mean mechanical artifacts and not the electronics that I'm used to. So uh, going to the next slide, and you saw a variant of this uh, chain, uh, digital manufacturing supply chain by my previous panelist. Uh, and as he pointed out, design engineers design artifacts using mechanical CAD tools, example, AutoCAD and so on. The design is then simulated to test for a range of desired properties, typically as he pointed out again, I want to reiterate, entails doing finite element analysis using a uh, range of finite element analysis software. And you go back and forth, un forth until you get the best design. And once the design passes the FEA analysis and checks, now it is ready for printing. And now it is in the stereo lithography format. And this format is independent of the target printer. I uh, here when you talk about a printer, it could be a range of printers, and uh, this is the this is my analogy. I call it the mechanical foundry. Uh, so the next step runs the STL files through the slicer software that essentially converts these three D models into a file of specific instructions for the printer to print, and this is what's the called the G code. Uh, of course, the G code is then loaded into the printer to print the artifact and the printers could be uh, a little more generic, uh, could be either additive, could be subtractive, could be hybrid, and a range of other things that my previous uh, panelists alluded to as well. So finally, the printer, the printed artifact is tested and released for use. So within this context, uh, if we go into the next slide, uh, jointly with uh, uh, experts, in uh, mechanical engineering, more specifically the team of uh, Professor Gupta and his uh, researchers. Uh, we at uh, NYU are looking into the security threats and implications of this digital manufacturing supply chain. Um, I just want to put this into context. In the electronics hardware context, the foundry is quite expensive, a few billion dollars, uh, five or so billion dollars for each foundry. So you don't find as many uh, foundries, uh, electronic foundries, and most of them uh, are somewhere in Asia uh, because the government subsidize and so on and so forth. But something different in terms of digital manufacturing, especially if you just focus on additive manufacturing, is that the printer or this mechanical foundry is relatively inexpensive. For uh, each one of you, if, uh, if you're just, uh, playing at home, and these could be as inexpensive as $150. But even the more expensive ones are about under $10 million. So in fact, each one of you or each one of us can own our own personal foundry in the mechanical context. So the threats in this context are hence, although look similar in one sense from the electronic hardware context, they are uh, different in another sense. Let me give you one example. Electronics foundries are not necessarily the prime source of attacks because they are small in number. They are uh, about maybe around 200 or so. And uh, so they're reasonably well protected. While personal DM foundries or additive manufacturing foundries, as you can see, are a prime source of attacks. They are cheap. Almost everybody uh, could potentially have a printer or could afford a printer. 
and so on and so forth. So what I want to focus is uh, reverse engineering. The goal of reverse engineering is just to do go the other way on the design flow, starting with a physical artifact. Uh, once uh, the attacker should be is in looking into recovering the design file at the various steps, either the G code or the STL file or the original uh, CAD model. Uh, uh, and, and one of the approaches that uh, my previous panelist, uh, Nectarios, pointed out was the side channels as a, a means to do that. Uh, so one can, once you recover the design file, you can do a variety of things. You can copy it, you can improve it, and use it without attribution or licensing or even weaponize it. So there's a range of things that you can do. So the next the slide well, um, uh, uh, talks about one approach uh, to defending against such reverse engineering. It's called obfuscation. And the, you can do other things, but obfuscation of a CAD model is one way to defend against reverse engineering. You can do this maybe by introducing sp some special features unknown to the attacker that prevent the printer from the artifact from being properly printed with high quality, satisfying all the mechanical uh, strength capabilities and so on. These sec the secrets in this context are the special conditions and the special embedded features. Uh, in fact, if you look at the leftmost side, uh, on the left-hand side, you have two specimens, one of them is printed in the uh, uh, is printed with a spline feature embedded, and if you fr uh, printed the wrong printing orientation, then you get the leftmost figure where the spline is actually printed. If you use the right orientation, then um, then the, you will have a printout without these splines and so on. And having these splines decreases the failure strain. And if you can look at the uh, on the right hand side, I have a table where it shows. That, if you have this XY spline, its uh, failure strain is much lower. That is, it fails earlier. It's less tough uh, 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 and other uh, less desirable properties. So that's one way of obfuscation. And there are other ways of doing obfuscation and there are other approaches to thwarting reverse engineering. So let's go to the final slide. And as they said, I wanted to, I wanted to highlight the taxonomy. The key takeaway is there are a plethora of threats associated with the digitization of the manufacturing chain. The, um, I talked about reverse engineering. The others include sabotage, the uh, overproduction. The outcomes, again, if you look at uh, the columns, include altered functionality or printer damage or spoofing of sensors. And the attack surface spans the entire digital manufacturing supply chain, all the way from the design all the way through test, uh, the printing and to testing and by the user that can reverse engineer and print uh, or co-opt your intellectual property using their own personal mechanical foundries. And that's my presentation and I'll stop here. Oh, thanks very much, uh, Professor. All right, um, so what we're doing, going to do now is move into the general Q&A part of this panel discussion. Um, already a few members of the audience have actually submitted some questions, so that's great. Uh, we've also had some questions pre-submitted before um, this event. So what we're going to do now is just sort of take some of these questions and put them towards the panelists and kind of just have a chat about them. Uh, to start us off with, we've got um, the first question is in general, cybersecurity is largely a topic for computer scientists, and it has not traditionally been a concern for, say, manufacturing specialists. What, in your opinion, should professionals involved in additive manufacturing be doing to prepare themselves for the intersection of these two fields? So I'll put that towards any of you to begin to get us started. So uh, I can pick up on that. I can uh, ma make a comment on that. So in fact, uh, uh, that's uh, Professor Nikhil Gupta and I uh, have been thinking about this particular question for some time. Uh, starting, uh, in fact, this fall, he and I are going to org uh, form, uh, jointly offer a class on additive manufacturing security, where uh, fact, hopefully, students from computer science 
and students from mechanical engineering come together and uh, understand both sides of the spectrum. The computer scientists understand how designs are done in a mechanical engineering perspective. And mechanical engineers understand that the software that they play with, these computers that they use are all vulnerable. And together, hopefully they can learn, uh, uh, understand the security mindset of uh, being a little more apprehensive when you use these design tools, when you use these design platforms, and when you design stuff using these 3D or printed or ready manufacturing artifacts. So, so the short answer is mechanical engineers should understand some ex to some extent some of the uh, cybersecurity implications, uh, and uh, the computer scientists should uh, should become more aware of the cyber physical implications in the mechanical engineering context. Okay. That's really, that was a really great answer. Um, I've actually got a very good question that's just come out of the audience. Um, there's sort of two that are related, so I'm going to combine them together. Um, so to Professor Chuchos, um, does the effect of the side channels used, does that vary based on the 3D technology used? So for instance, if you were going to be using with like a resin printer, um, which rely on different kinds of motor configurations, um, will it always have the same effect or are other 3D technologies more difficult or more easy to, to get side channel information from? So uh, that's a very good question. Uh, thank you, Hammond, and thank you for the audience members for asking this question. So this is true. Uh, so there are several classes of 3D printers. You have the fused deposition modeling 3D printers, which is essentially the printers that uh, melt a uh, material like uh, plastic essentially and then built layer by layer but there are also resin printers that they use DLP projectors and they have a membrane that allows the material to start building up and they use one motor to go up uh, and there are also uh, printers that they have metal powder or plastic powder and they use a laser to melt it so these technologies they they have different threats and uh, the, the threats that uh, I quickly presented in the overview today from uh, related work, focus mostly on FDM printers. However, the threat of side channels uh, is not unique to FDM printers. For example, if someone is able to compromise an embedded IoT camera and be able to look at the printer uh, while the printer is moving, or be able to see uh, from uh, by, by putting a, a camera sensor through the window, they, can, they are able to see uh, very quickly the, the path of the laser while it is melting the powder, that would also uh, act as a side channel. Also, in the example that I showed you that you are able to listen to a computer applying the RSA algorithm in similar ways, it may be possible to listen to the uh, processor in the 3D printer processing the G-code command. So even though we don't have uh, uh, examples in the literature that focus on resin printers or, or metal printers, uh, this is uh, indeed possible in theory, given that the acoustic side channel uh, reveals the information that is being given to the printer in form of G-code uh, instructions. Great. Um, and now a question for um, Don. Uh, industry is rapidly adopting additive manufacturing, as you said in your presentation, because of capabilities uh, like the ones that you advertised. Um, obviously, it, it's a lot of effort to go through and um, create all of these, uh, this IP essentially that you're going to be 3D printing or ad additive manufacturing in other ways. Uh, really alluded to some strategies that you could be using that are sort of more general for protecting that IP. Um, which, what sort of strategy have you seen actually used in industry to protect the IP of um, additive manufacturing parts? Yeah, thanks for the question. I think it's really the, the basic IT kind of protection. Encrypt the files, limit access to who gets files uh, on the servers, make sure the telecommunications are encrypted. Um, there's a certain amount of trust in the employees slash operators as well. So I don't know that, that it's really much different in this space than it is protecting any other IP of an engineering drawing or a new patentable process. It's kind of the basic stuff. The, uh, the additive, the global distributed additive process though, opens up a few new windows where you have 
multiple printers, different countries, different laws. There's all kinds of tax implications potential to come out of all that as well. So it makes it a little more complex when you're trying to do distributed manufacturing because of the nature of the thing. But I think initially the, the work has been protect the files, protect the network. Yeah, and to follow up to that, um, recently, uh, especially currently, you know, a lot of employees are working from home at the moment due to the COVID-19 situation. Um, is, is, this going, is this likely or, or more or less likely to result in, you know, IP theft just because employees are going to be accessing sensitive files from outside, you know, their secured workplace? Or is it uh, that, you know, the companies are probably investing significant amounts of effort to prevent that from happening? Yeah, I think, I think it's typical companies, especially at any scale, that have virtual private networks in place. They do a lot of encryption, control access to the software on the PCs, even issuing PCs that are company-owned where they monitor USB ports to see if anybody's moving files off the PC. So I think they're using that technology to protect all their IP that's moving across the network at this time. And any engineering that's occurring, I would use the same technology, I think. Cool. Um, sort of related to this same COVID thoughts again, um, just because you were mentioning uh, hearing aids that are manufactured um, additively, uh, the other types of things that have been making headlines recently is um, PPE that's been manufactured for the COVID crisis added, uh, via 3D printing and that sort of thing. It's been in the news quite a lot recently. Um, has the use of 3D printing for this health pandemic taught us anything new about AM security or has it mostly been other other parts of AM that people have been learning from? I guess my opinion is that the, the things that I've seen that have been printed to help with the, with the coronavirus epidemic or pandemic has been, you know, very simple plastic face shield connections, um, things for masks. So I, I don't know that those have any real security impact with COVID. I can't speak to any medical work that's going on. It's not my specialty, but it seems like the, the, the specific to COVID has been kind of base, basic polymer plastic printing. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Um, another question for um, Nectarios. Um, yes. For the side channel attacks, have any attacks been actually um, seen in the wild, as it were, or is it mostly still, um, you know, just done in, in the academic setting? So this uh, this is a great question. Uh, a, a very interesting observation about any cyber attack is that uh, even though you may not hear it in the news, you may not, you know, see it on TV, you cannot actually prove that this hasn't happened, right? You cannot prove a negative. Uh, the, merely the fact that it is easy to do that with a smartphone by placing a smartphone next to a printer and actually demonstrate that by writing an application on the phone, you can, uh, you can exfiltrate some information uh, makes it practical. Uh, not in the sense that everybody that uh, has a printer is vulnerable, but in the sense that the barrier, the cost barrier for an attacker is relatively low. And especially in uh, cases where there are printers that are, are attended and there is personnel that uh, moves in and out, it would be easy to sneak in a mobile phone and put it next to the printer. So having said that, uh, there aren't uh, official uh, reports that this has happened to a particular company, but again, uh, even if it had happened and it would be industrial espionage, uh, we probably won't uh, be able to learn about it uh, in the news. Okay. Um, yeah, I, I, I guess sort of related to that, but um, kind of this is a more general question is mm -hmm. for, for everyone, what do you think the biggest security threats are right now? Like if I had just set up an AM manufacturing company, what should I be most worried about? Uh, so I can I can make a quick comment on that. So uh, it, it depends on the size of the facility, right? So most expensive uh, 3D printers, like the metal uh, printers, uh, SLS printers, uh, they this is very expensive equipment, right? In some cases, can be hundreds of thousands or, or millions of dollars. So uh, during the procurement pro uh, process and as part of the service level agreement between the buyer and the vendor. Uh, typically, they may require remote access from the vendor. And here, the big concern is how you secure that remote access. If you have in your organization, if you have proper uh, firewall rules, if you have proper 
uh, cybersecurity controls, proper access control, uh, VPN, uh, in order to be able to securely control access to that printer. Because if that remote access is not protected, an adversary could maliciously try to log in and maybe uh, gain access to files that are temporarily stored in the queue of the printer or be able to maliciously update the firmware of the printer and then make the printer report back to you, phone home, and give you a copy of the 3D file or the G-code instructions. So there are all sorts of things that can happen if it is possible for an external party to maliciously log into the printer and modify its firmware. I think a lot from the industry side too, there's a, a lot, in addition to that, there's a lot of concern about the ability to counterfeit parts. And so the ability for academia and the uh, printer OEMs to come up with some kind of watermarks or embedded 3D, you know, uh, barcoding that's that's only done with a scanner is going to be really important as, as companies implement this technology out in the field. They're going to want to know that their parts are are real when they come back for warranty. And they want to make sure that as they produce new IP that they can market with their with their uh, trademarks so that they can protect the IP. Yeah, so I guess related to that trademarking question actually, um, we had a question from the audience saying that um, watermarking uh, is, is well used in other fields, for instance, like stock photographs and things like that. Art, artists sign their paintings and things like that. Is there a standard watermarking technique that's used for additive manufacturing at the moment? Or is it all sort of proprietary or, or just use of things like barcodes and QR codes? Uh, I can pick up and maybe somebody else can follow. So I don't, additive manufacturing does not have, at least for the, in the, in the uh, in the manufacturer in the am printers that we buy the, you don't have too many of these security uh, security mechanisms watermarking probably is not there but having said that you could imagine new ways of embedding barcodes embedding watermarks during printing which is different from uh, what you see when you do watermarking on paper and so on so, so it gives you an interesting opportunity to explore creating uh, uh, watermarks or uh, take this uh, 3D barcode that Professor uh, Gupta and his uh, uh, colleagues have done. They took the 3D, 2D, uh, 3D barcode, it blew it up and embedded into the uh, artifact. And if you look at it the right direction and then scan it, then you know that uh, you can authenticate it using that watermark or that embedded uh, code. So that's one way of doing it. But these are inexpensive ways that can exploit the manufacturing uh, specific uh, aspects of uh, AM. This is a, just just to, to chime in, the, the ability to do the scanning you, that you just mentioned, uh, companies can get other really accretive benefits from investing in some of these 3D scanners. You can put parts in that you don't have the blueprints and get a relatively good 3D file back that you can take in your CAD system and clean up the artifacts and then you have a drawing that you can use. Second one is the scanning like you just mentioned if you implement 3D barcoding within the part. But the third one's also for quality. So if you have, these scanners are very expensive if they're if the if the box is of any size. So and if they have the penetration power to get into metal parts. So if you have that investment you can also use those for quality checks for not only parts that are come off that are 3D printed, but for other parts that come off traditional subtractive manufacturing and do quality checks at receiving time and to the distribution network. So companies may find they can justify a couple million dollar investment in some of these scanners through a number of different uses. I guess related to the scanning area then, so that this is just gonna segue us into a sort of a legal question now. Um, let's say from a like a like a pro consumer point of view so say i'm someone at home and a part breaks say i've got a pair of headphones and the power switch breaks um i have the capability because i have one of these scanners or because the part is quite small to recreate the broken part in a cad software and then say i have a cheap 3d printer and then i print that broken part to repair my own set of headphones is that in any way a violation of the intellectual property of the people who first designed that part? Would that be 
considered problematic from a legal standpoint to say, well, hey, you know, I have copied your part essentially to repair my product, which I did originally purchase from you. But this aftermarket part I have produced from a scan of your property. I'm not an attorney, but the discussions I had in industry have been, I, I don't think that that is a problem if a consumer does that because you already bought the part product from the company. It's when you scan it and then try to sell the parts as either a, a genuine part or a will fit gray market part that that's the real problem in the derivative work. But again, not an attorney. And I guess related to that would be, um, uh, you know, uh, patents and impersonating parts are already a, a problem and outside of the US. So I, I can have a US patent on my product, um, but then other people might produce that in another jurisdiction. Is this going to be even more of a problem when it comes to additively manufactured parts that are designed to be easy to produce? Yeah, I think, I mean, from the industry side, I think it's a massive problem. Um, the technology has not quite caught up with the opportunity yet. I mean, I, I don't think anyone knows how to take the same exact, you know, GE printer or whatever and put it in Singapore and in Moscow and in Sao Paulo, Brazil and in Miami and have the same part come off the printer every time. They're, the technology just isn't quite there yet for mass production like that. But as that, and that will get solved. And as it does, this is gonna become much more of an issue. But I think we have a little bit of time to sort it out before it's a real impact. Until now, I, th I think, especially for metals, it's pretty hard to, to do that at, at this point. Okay. Um, I have a question here from the audience for Professor Curry. Uh, many of the tools used in the design and manufacturing phase of uh, ICs, but also, uh, you know, our own CAD um, products for additive manufacturing are closed and proprietary, for instance, cadence or synopsis. Um, so even if we can prove that our final product meets our design specification, so we prove that, you know, in some way that our product wasn't tampered with, how can one prove that the closed tools that we used to produce this IP didn't do something malicious along the way in terms of stealing our IP or extracting something? Excellent question. I think that's a real possibility. The likelihood of that happening is low, but uh, uh, but the question, uh, yeah, the, the tools could be an attack vector. Until now, people have been looking at designs being attack vectors, channels, side channels being attack vectors, reverse engineering as being attack vectors. But closed tools are an important issue as well, not just because they are bad or malicious. Even if they are buggy, they might open up uh, 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 avenues for uh, others to attack. So a buggy code could uh, make some wrong or some random decisions uh, when coming to printing, and that might have implications or that from an exploitation perspective. So uh, it happens uh, in uh, cadence uh, uh, in the integrated circuit uh, area much more. I'm sure. Uh, the CAT tools, the test tools, and the uh, STL to slicer conversion, the, the slicer tools, if they're closed source, they may have their own, uh, could potentially be the attack vectors into the additive manufacturing design process. So I guess related to that as well, given that these are proprietary tools that are I mean, this is one of the big differences between, say, um, a VLSI and additive manufacturing as it stands at the moment, is a lot of the VLSI tools like Cadence and Synopsis are proprietary and closed source and difficult to use. Whereas if you compare that with the really burgeoning development of open source, open standards for 3D printing, uh, do you think that there is some chance that we might see a move towards proprietary closed systems for 3D printing? You know, say, like a, a Netflix of 3D parts that you can print that only goes to your DRM locked printer to make sure you don't, you know, uh, steal any parts yourself. Uh, do you guys have any perspectives on that? If you look at some of these uh, 
commercial 3D printers, they're high-end printers. Uh, uh, they are reasonably proprietary in the tools that they support. So you just cannot uh, take tools uh, uh, from uh, anywhere and take the outputs of those uh, G codes and directly you plug them into these uh, high-end 3D printers. And the low-end 3D printers, these are all open source and uh, they're just patched up from existing open source tools. So it's doable. Uh, but uh, would the, the, the DRM kind of a thing, would they hook up? I think since our experience with DRM hasn't been that good, I don't think people would may do something like that, may not phrase it as such. Uh, uh, rather than say, uh, saying linking your product to a particular platform or linking your product to a particular tool and so on and so forth. So that's my personal opinion because of the, the uh, bad re uh, rep that the DRM got. I think the, I think the industry is going to have to have some standardization occur eventually. There are literally hundreds of new 3D printing OEMs every year. Many of them go bankrupt. Some get some scale, but it's so uh, it's so fragmented, and the tools are so new, and it's maturing so fast. I think eventually the oh, you know people that are going to spend a couple million dollars on printers are going to want some kind of standards to be put in place for not only build file the, the G code and security, but I think we're a ways out from that until the industry sorts itself out a little bit. Uh, I have another question on side channels for um, Professor Chushos um, from the audience. Uh, I have experience from Boeing in Missouri. They use a lot of 3D rendering as well as 3D printing within its industry. Um, from what I can understand, most of their industries are isolated and I'm wondering how a side channel attack could occur under strict conditions. For instance, when I went on a tour, um, our ability to use our phones or any other electronics were prohibited outside of the labs and within their museum. So I guess the question is, uh, how accessible are side channel attacks if your facility is very locked down? Thank you. This, this is a very good question. And uh, of course, it, it bears down on what are the physical security uh, controls that an organization is having. Uh, but as we have seen in the past, in other, uh, in the in similar in a similar context, it is possible for uh, again disgruntled employees or or people who uh, have a, uh, are visiting uh, or are inside a secure area. For example, uh, people who uh, uh, perform cleaning in an area. For example, they they get access, and uh, in most cases uh, there are potential threats where someone can carry that mobile device and actually be able to place it in close proximity. And if we are talking about uh, uh, the, the attack that I mentioned about uh, acoustic side channels or the, the attack that I demonstrated where you can use this telescope and you can detect the vibrations on the light, maybe uh, it is possible to have sufficient distance from that room through uh, a glass door to be able to exfiltrate some type of information. Of course, if you have strict physical security controls, that risk is mitigated. But as we have seen, and we are always being surprised by how effective side channel attacks are, it still may be possible for someone who has a function in that building to be able to, to leave uh, a malicious device that can try to exfiltrate. Um, also related to one of your earlier remarks where you were talking about um, the health risks of audio, uh, counter audio side channels. Uh, I guess the question is what exactly does the uh, counter audio look like such that it would be a health risk? Is it in the, it, in the room? It would create it, a headache. <laughs> extremely it, it, loud noises. It okay. would create, it would definitely create a headache, yes. Okay. So we have seen this, uh, this example. Uh, there are people who, uh, for example, wear, uh, are wearing uh, headphones that do noise cancellation and they, they feel uh, a headache because of so it, it, it is different between uh, different people, uh, but it's going to be a risk if you, if you mandate the company to have these anti-audio side channel protections when humans are in, in the area. Hmm. Um, so this is a, sort of a general question for all of you now. Um, another question from the audience, which is um, there's been a lot of talk going on how we can uh, potentially uh, reverse engineer a product to counterfeit it. Um, 
how expensive would you say as a cost is it to do that in the real world to actually say hey we've got a product or our competitor has a product and we want to produce a counterfeit of that how expensive is it actually to do that from a from a standpoint nowadays it's always for the industry it's always been a problem there, there have been all automotive heavy equipment companies engine companies have lots of people that are stealing their business with counterfeit parts so the reverse engineering is not usually very difficult with the 3d if the part I guess if the if the part, the metrology, and the strength of the part, especially things like organic structuring, are in the new design, I think that becomes something that maybe is a little harder for other companies to reproduce because there's so much setup required, like I mentioned earlier, with the temperature and the control of exactly what tilt is uh, performed in the printer to get the right tensile strength. I think there's some new ways that, that companies can protect their 3D printed IP, but they'll all, they're always going to be companies and, and suppliers that want to steal the IP. There are probably agencies or entities for whom cost may not be a, a, a concern at all. For, uh, right. so, so, these are, so, so if cost is not a concern, that's okay. But uh, a, a context, uh, to, to place this in context, right? If you go to electronics and do reverse engineering of electronics, imagine seven nanometer technology and reverse engineering of the technology. And that's done routinely these days, just for uh, IP verification uh, to fight uh, patent infringement and so on. So, uh, uh, so, and to understand what the new de designs are and so on and so forth. So. And if you look at uh, additive manufacturing, it's about ten, uh, about a few orders of magnitude, much more larger uh, artifacts. So the expense, it's, 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 it's that much from a cost perspective, more easier to re uh, retrieve or recollect the original uh, spe specification, either the, uh, the, the, the style file or the CAD file. And then of course, once you have that, you can make other things. So, so the cost relative to electronics might be relatively lower, but as uh, Don pointed out, it's the other uh, things like the temperature, the curing temperature and the, the other things that might be a little more tricky. But uh, once you have the file, then you can play with it and you make it better. I think you can make a better product than the original designer intended it to anyway. Yeah. So um, this goes back a little bit towards your presentation right at the start, Don. Um, you talked about how one of the benefits of additive manufacturing is that there's overall a decreased production cost because a lot of your tooling you don't need anymore. Uh, and you know, your, a lot of your big factories are just getting converted into smaller machinery. And um, this is more, more of a question based on, say, the number of staff that are required. Is there more or less or oh, more or fewer staff required in terms of producing things additively if we were going to convert a business from a traditional manufacturing technique into additive manufacturing? Yeah, thanks for the question. I, um, I, th I think po right now polymers and metals are, are very different. So it's the, the technology around polymers and plastics, you can produce a lot of parts pretty quickly. And I think there's always a curve on where injection molding, for example, is probably still going to be less expensive on plastics. But on on metals, it's um, a little different situation. I think the uh, the tool because of the tooling and because of the minimum order quantities from the suppliers, typically, uh, especially if you have to set up um, castings and do negative molds and produce all the molds to do a casting there's a tremendous amount of setup there. So that staff isn't needed if you're going to 3D print the part. You still have the same 3D drawing, same, same exact build or design file. You have to create, somebody has to create the build file to match the printer that you're using as we discussed earlier. So that's a different set of technology. But the offset in lead time, minimum order quantity, setup, tooling uh, is, is incredibly different with additive compared to subtractive. Now, once the part comes out of a, once the metal part comes out of a 3D printer, it still has to be post-processed. So you still have that expense, whether you cast the part or printed it, you still have post-processing, which in most cases is probably a push. 
So I think I think the opportunity is pretty significant um, around metals, especially. Um, you've mentioned there some differences between polymers and metals. Uh, would there be a difference in the IP protection required for those kinds of parts, or is it a similar sort of challenge? I think I'll defer to the other uh, panelists on that. I didn't get their opinions. Again, I'm not a mechanical engineer, but let me uh, make a couple of comments. From what I hear from uh, my mechanical engineering colleagues, uh, some of these uh, materials might be more resistant to reverse engineering or more resistant, to, uh, more difficult to extract uh, physical artifacts, uh, even if you use advanced imaging and so on. So uh, metals are a little more difficult is what I hear. Uh, resin and plastics might be a little less difficult because you can, if you, if you physically look at a, uh, using a low end printer, using this uh, cheap uh, uh, resins and so, or less expensive resins and so on, you can almost look at the print path and so on, uh, tool path and so on. But if it is um, uh, FDM, fuse deposition and so on, so, so some of those artifacts uh, and microstructures in the metals are not as apparent and obvious. So that, I think in that sense, the differences, uh, the protections that you apply at the high level might be the same, but uh, the details might vary based on the material itself. So just to add to that, um, so I think uh, at some level, uh, the, the threat model is slightly different. Uh, if you have, let's say, a, a FDM printer versus a, a metal printer. Because of the way they work, uh, in one case, if you want to, let's say you have a, a rod and you want to be able to break, okay, the attack is to make it break earlier. Uh, in one case, you would uh, try to not put material if, in the FDM case. So you will have air and maybe through, uh, through a scanner, an X-ray scanner, you will be able to see uh, that there is a air creating voids. But if you have uh, a sintering printer where you would still have an enclosure with unsintered uh, powder or resin, uh, that would make it uh, more difficult to detect. Like not impossible, but it would make it more diff harder to detect. And you will have unsintered material that doesn't have any effect in terms of strength, uh, while if you try to, to use a, a not very accurate uh, detection method for the void, you won't be able to see. Cool. Um, and this might be one of our last questions, uh, depending on how our time is going. Uh, this one's from the audience. Um, you mentioned, uh, Professor Curry, in your uh, talk about obfuscation of designs. Um, more commonly, I think, um, people from the computer science field would know obfuscation as applied to computer code. Um, for instance, it's very common to obfuscate JavaScript before it gets sent to a client's browser so that it's more difficult to reverse engineer what's going on, on the, in the web page. Um, there's a lot of techniques existing currently for de-obfuscating computer code. So I run my code through an obfuscator, I can then run my code through a de-obfuscator and get something that's hopefully a bit more usable out at the end. Are there similar techniques for obfuscating and then de-obfuscating hardware designs? Oh, you're muted. Yeah, thanks. Uh, so I think this is still about happening. Uh, the, the idea of obfuscation that we present there is uh, to remove some of the property, uh, the printer, printhead properties out of the file and apply it at a different to a stage in the printing process rather than putting them all at the same place. So if you look at that the obfuscate paper that the Nikarios and Nikhil, Professor Nikhil Gupta created, that's so, and the orientation, also you take away the orientation element. So when you say obfuscation, it's not just reordering or reorienting the codes, but also taking away some pieces of code at different points and introducing them at a different, a later point in the supply, in the design chain uh, so, so once you have two pieces, bringing them together at the later point is what this obfuscation does. Uh, so when you steal a file, that uh, properties of materials are, no are not present in the style file or the G code file. So in that way, it's better. So in that sense, the obfuscation of the traditional kind that uh, are the kind that the computer scientists are talking about may not necessarily work the, the, because in, 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 in there you have uh, 
code that's obfuscated made too difficult to read or uh, comprehend and so on and so forth. Does that obfuscation work as a counter to say a side channel attack? So yes. So uh, as I said before, uh, if we think about the, the simple case of uh, uh, let's say uh, FDM printer, the way the FDM printer works is there is a head that is extruding melted plastic and the motors move the head around and give a signal to extrude more plastic. Now, if you, you have the ability to introduce in the G code, the toolpath instructions that tell the printer what to do, an instruction that says, stop extruding any plastic and just move the head around. So if you have a side channel, the, uh, the attacker would not be able to to identify easily that you're not actually extruding uh, any plastic at that moment, and they will detect the sound of the uh, the step motors that move the head, right? So that would that would make it harder for them. Maybe not impossible because if you have like four motors, the fourth one being the extruder, they will detect that that motor is not working. But again, it will introduce one uh, significant uh, level of difficulty uh, for them to be able to reverse engineer and, and, and steal the idea. Just a note too on the metal printers that use like binder jet technology, those doesn't have to be centered. So you have a completely separate opportunity to protect and obfuscate the, the IP around the, the furnace and the whole curing process that doesn't exist on plastics. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Great. All right, well, I think we're pretty much out of time, guys. So um, thank you incredibly for coming today. Um, I'm just going to share uh, our... Uh, next event once more. Let's see, let me go back. Um, so the uh, next event in this series um, is, should now be on your guys' screens, um, and it's going to be on increasing diversity in cyber physical system research and the workforce. Uh, and that should be a really good, um, like this one, a very good panel discussion on August the 24th. So I encourage everyone to register. Um, thanks everyone for submitting your questions and thanks again to our panelists for answering the questions uh, and doing such a great job today. Uh, and thanks also, of course, to the National Science Foundation uh, and NYU Tandon School of Engineering. Great, thanks. Thank you. Thank you very much.